How many of you attended the Seder Friday night? Oh, was that not a good Seder? Huh? Ah, yeah. How about the lamb? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you were first timers at the Seder? Ah, oh, yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to share about your experience that night, Friday night? If you're not too uh, embarrassed, timid? <coughs> Overwhelming. 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 Yeah, it, it brings such significance to this celebration that we're having today. When John was there baptizing at the Jordan at Bethabara, a place of passage, a house of passage, exactly where Yahshua had brought the children of Israel across on dry land, dry land, across the Jordan. When he was baptizing that day and Yahshua came, what did he say? Behold. That's not what he said, though, was it? What did he say? Pesach. Pesach. Behold the Pesach, Hebrew for Passover, Peshka in the Greek text, Passover. Is uh, Easter a biblical term? No. Isn't it quite grievous or sad? So many are ignorant of so many things which they claim to hold in regard. Easter is not in the Bible. You won't find the word Easter in the Bible, but the King James translators, when they came to the word Pesca, which is the equivalent of the Greek, of the Hebrew Pesach, it was too Jewish for them. And so they interpreted it Easter. And Easter comes from where? Its origin, its meaning? Babylon, Babylon the worship of the goddess Eshtarte in the decoration of Eshtar eggs in the revering of the Eshtar bunny. This is 2022, isn't it? The enlightened age, computer technology, information at our fingertips. It's grievous, isn't it? Now, if it's grievous to us, mere mortals, how grievous it must be to the God of the Passover. For Paul would declare in Corinthians, for Christ, our Passover has come, our Pesach. And so when John said that that day at the shore of the Jordan, behold the Pesach, who takes away the sins of the world, every Jew would have understood exactly what he was meaning then. That Jesus would be the burnt offering, that sacrifice that would be made for the sins, not just the sins of the Jews, but for the sins of the world. Yeah. Yeah, someone had made the uh, statement that before our Seder, they said there's a shortage of lamb now. That's what the Peter house was telling us. And I said, no, no, no. There is never a shortage of the lamb. There is enough of the lamb for the entire world, isn't there? Yeah. Behold the Pesach, who takes away the sins of the world. Hmm? And so he was crucified, as we learned on Friday night. He was presented before Israel on what day? The 10th day of the Jewish month, Nizan, Nizan. The 10th day of the Jewish month of Nizan, he fulfilled the law of the Passover in which the lamb was presented. Behold the lamb of God, right? And then he was crucified on what day? The 14th day of the same month, the month of Nizan, right on the specific day of Passover. Such a coincidence. No. Coincidence is not a kosher word, the rabbis say, right? The very next day after the 14th was what day? The 15th, very good, very good. <laughs> and what was the 15th? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what did that symbolize figuratively, not literally? What did it symbolize? The removal of the sin of the world. Leaven. Leaven was a type of sin, right, in the Bible? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, right? When you make bread, ladies, you like to, you like to put the yeast in there, the leaven, right? And then you have to give it time to... And how does it rise? By corrupting. The, the actual leaven expedites the corrupting process, the rotting process of the bread, so that it rises, it corrupts by puffing up. Well, that's what pride does too, doesn't it? Yeah. But all traces of leaven were to be removed from the Jewish household during the fast of, Feast of Passover. That was Jewish spring cleaning, right? But the very next feast lumped together with Passover, when they talk about Passover, they talk about that week of celebration, 
Passover, unleavened bread, as Pastor David made mention to before he started the worship set. By the way, what, what's today? What's today? Thank you. It's the 17th of March, isn't it? Hmm. April, excuse me, April. I'm getting it. <laughs> Time goes too fast when you're an old man. <laughs> the 17th day has great significance. We'll talk about that in a moment. But turn to Matthew 28. And no one, no mortal could possibly express all that is meant on this day, this celebration of the resurrection. And certainly not I. But would you pray with me one more time as you're turning to Matthew 28? Father, I simply ask you that what I am not, would you make me? What I know not, would you teach me? What I have not, would you give me? Not for my glory, not for my sake, Lord, but for yours and for the sake of your people and for my good and the good of your church. Jesus, you obeyed all of the will of the Father to bring glory to him. For the fellowship of the suffering is our opportunity to bring glory to you, Jesus. But just as you experienced the suffering of the cross, you also had the great joy of celebrating the resurrection, the resurrection of your body and the birth of your church. You endured the suffering of the cross with a joy that lied therein, the joy of your salvation. Lord, it is so important for each of us here, everyone in my hearing, in this sanctuary and over the internet, Lord, to not just acknowledge this day in an intellectual sense, but Lord, we want to experience the resurrection in our own hearts and lives, Lord. Lord, it would be my prayer that everyone, everyone in my hearing would truly, sincerely, honestly desire to glorify you, Lord Jesus, by living a resurrected life in the power of your Holy Spirit. That's what you've placed upon my heart this morning to convey to these, your children. I pray it would penetrate the heart, Lord, not just the mind, not just enter into the ears, Lord, but go deep down into the heart of each and every single individual who would truly live an obedient life to you, Lord Jesus, to bring glory to you, just as you brought glory to the Father through your obedience and your suffering, so we too may bring glory to you through our obedience and our self-denial. So, Lord, make us, give us, show us what we have not, Lord, in your holy and precious name. And everyone said. Amen. The record of the resurrection here in, in Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and he rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring the disciples' word. <laughs> this event has changed all of world history, hasn't it? Yes, yes. We even mark history based upon the timing of the Lord's death, resurrection. Turn to me to the resurrection chapter in the Bible. Which, by, which chapter would that be? 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. Turn with me there. 
what we're going to be talking about this morning is evidences of the resurrection. Now, it's unfortunate that there are a number of people who don't believe that the resurrection ever occurred. And even in Paul's day, there were those who doubted it, but Paul, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, presents his argument for the resurrection. He gives an apologetic. The first section, the first 11 verses, he's giving a historical argument. From verses 12 through 28, he's giving a... From 12 to 19, he's giving a logical argument. I better wear my glasses. And from 20 to 28, a theological and then an experiential. We're going to go through the first three quickly, and then I'm going to talk about a different experiential apologetic for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you also were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I have received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So important, right? The scriptures. Would we have any understanding whatsoever of Christianity if it wasn't for the scriptures? How could anyone say that Christianity is not based upon 66 ancient documents? Contemporary pastors claim that today. Christianity is not based upon 66 ancient documents. It's based upon your experience with the risen Lord today. There's no understanding of Christianity without the Bible. Hmm. According to the scriptures. Verse 4, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So everything is affirmed through the scriptures. As Peter would say, this is that which is spoken of. So whatever we believe, whatever we practice, we should always have our basis in the word of God, the scriptures. Risen on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. They've died. But after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born, as one born out of due time. The Apostle Paul says he was one born out of due time. What does that mean? He was born out of due time? He, he was resurrected. You see, beloved, we will experience two resurrections if you're a believer. The first is a spiritual resurrection that you will experience. The second will be a physical resurrection that we will experience and have the gift of eternal life. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. I'm getting ahead of myself. Excuse me. My mind is racing. <laughs> Let me pause for a moment. Lord, I have far more to share than I have time. And I have far more thoughts swirling around in my head right now. But I want you to sort them out, Lord, and give me the ability to present this <laughs> logically. Lord, intellectually, passionately, so that they would understand the things you placed in my heart this morning to give to your people. Amen. So in this uh, first 15 or 11 verses in chapter 15, he's talking about the fact that there were many eyewitnesses of the event. It's this historical argument of the resurrection. Now in verse 12, he begins to talk about a logical argument of the resurrection. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain. This is all empty words. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom if he did not raise, in fact, the dead are not raised. And if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most to be pitied, pitiable. If Christ has not risen from the dead, 
What's the purpose? Eat, drink, and be merry, for we die, it's all over. Annihilation. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Then he goes on to present a theological argument based upon what the Jews understood of the laws that God had given his people. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die. That means that all. All is all. All are dead. Dead. Necros is the word. Dead. Corpse. For in Adam all have died. Hmm? Even so, in Christ, all shall be resurrected, made alive, spiritually. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father, and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Oh, my God. How many of you have been affected by death, had such pain and sorrow and anguish and grief come over you, and, and some of those things we're still carrying today, and we'll continue to carry them until we leave here. One day, one day, we will have the privilege and the joy to celebrate the death of death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. This is the theological argument that Paul presents, but what he says is, is that Jesus, the first fruits. Now, he's speaking of that feast, the first fruits, just as Jesus literally on the very day fulfilled the Passover, didn't he? He was presented on the 10th, crucified on the 14th. On the very day, the sin problem was resolved. On the 15th, the sins of the world were taken away for those who would believe. There was enough lamb for everyone in the world, right? Oh, but then the next feast after the feast of unleavened bread was the feast of first fruits. When did that occur? According to Leviticus 23, the feast of first fruits was always celebrated on the day after the normal Saturday Sabbath, immediately following Passover. It's always celebrated on the day after the normal Saturday Sabbath, immediately following Passover. And unlike Passover, which is the 14th, unlike unleavened bread, which is the 15th, unlike the other feast days, this feast day was not tied to a specific day in the calendar, but a time with regard to the previous feast. So it's always the day after the Sabbath, so that would be what day? Sunday. Sunday. Always the Sunday on the day after the normal Saturday Sabbath after Passover. Now, in the year in which our Lord was crucified, what day was that? Do you know what day that would have been? If he was, if he was crucified on the 14th and three days and three nights he was in the heart of the earth and then he rose, what day did he raise? 14 plus 3? Good, good. <laughs> he, rose, he rose from the dead on the 17th day of the Jewish month of? Nazan, Nazan the Feast of First Fruits. On the 17th, uh, just take a walk for a minute with me over to Genesis chapter 8. The 17th day of Nazan, Christ was raised from the dead. A new beginning for the world, isn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, a new beginning for you and me, specifically who believe. But look with me at Genesis chapter 8. Now, what's taking place here, contextually, historically? What's happening here? Noah. Noah. Noah entered the ark, right? And the flood came. Noah left that sinful world that was in total rebellion to God. What was the characterized that portion of the world, the pre-diluvian world before the flood? Violence was everywhere. Oh, you hear about all the shootings this weekend? All of the unnecessary violence... The Columbiana Mall in Columbia, South Carolina. Did you hear about that? Several people shot while they're doing their shopping Saturday afternoon. What is it with all the violence today? The violence is demonic. And it's demonically inspired. Most of our society is controlled by the demons, not by the Lord. And just as Noah's day was characterized by violence, so is our day. And Jesus said, it'll be as in 
the days of Noah. So shall it be when the Son of Man returns. And we are living in a time that is very, very similar to the days of Noah. Again, I encourage you to read Dr. Henry Morris's book, The Genesis Record. And he presents all of the evidence. What were some of the things that were common in Noah's day? Yes, the violence was everywhere. What else was common? Blatant, militant, what? Homosexuality, lesbianism, gender confusion, dysphoria. Hmm. What else was characteristic in Noah's day? An obsession with the occult. If you study the period then, there was a great obsession with the occult, much like in our day today. Isn't that amazing? So God had to flush the place. God caused a great flood. So all of that world, as far as Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives knew, that world was now gone. And they're floating in the ark, being cared for, right? The ark is a type of Christ, hmm? As they're going through the tribulations of those waters, right? But we know that there was a time that God had determined that the ark would rest and they would walk out of that ark into a new, what? A new world. The old world was gone. They were walking out into a new world, a new beginning for Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. So in chapter 8, in verse 4, it says, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Now that month was called... At this point, what? You remember? Abib. Abib. But later, after the Babylonian captivity, what was it called? Nizan. So the month Abib was changed to Nizan. But listen to me now. There's no coincidence here that the ark rested on the 17th day of the same month, the same day that Jesus would raise from the dead, a new beginning for Noah and his family, a new beginning for our world. But not only that, not only that, look with me for a moment. Go to Exodus chapter 3. Chapter 3. Verse 18, now uh, Moses is being instructed by God. That's what he's instructed to tell Pharaoh to release his people. Uh, specifically in chapter 3, verse 18, then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us and now please let us go, what? Three, Three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Chapter 5 of Exodus. Chapter 5. Verse 3, so they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and to sacrifice to the Lord our God. At least he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. Go to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 27. Exodus chapter 8 verse 27 and we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commanded us. Why is the Lord emphasizing three days, three days, three days, three days journey from when? Chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. What did we celebrate last night? Uh, Friday night, excuse me. The Pesach, Passover. Huh? Hmm. And didn't that wonderful, didn't that guy do a wonderful job Friday night in leading us in that Passover? Huh? Me boy, me boy. <laughs> Chapter 12 is the law of the Passover. And God releasing his people, the first Passover that would be experienced there in Egypt. And when did they crucify, when, excuse me, when did they sacrifice these lambs? Every single household was to take a lamb. And then it, the text tells us the lamb. And then it says your lamb. And he says, now all of the congregation of Israel shall sacrifice it. Singular. Singular. Look at the text for a moment. This is very important. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 uh, verse 4 it says, uh, verse 3 says, on the 10th day you'll select a lamb. Four, verse 4 says, it'll be the lamb. Verse 5 says, it's your lamb. Verse 6 says, on the 14th day of the same month, 
that's Nazan, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill. Singular. There are thousands of lambs sacrificed that night, that first Passover. But why does the Holy Spirit engineer in the text it? Because it's obviously speaking of Christ, our Passover the Passover lamb who would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Now, now, what did they do? They, they, each of their households, you know, there's a trench before every one of their houses. They lived in these huts and dirt floors, and they had to build these trenches in front of their houses. Why? For the water runoff. You don't want the water running through your house. You want it running around and, and away, right? So where do you think they would sacrifice these lambs and let the blood drain? Right in front of the house, in the drainage ditch there, Okay. And so they would sacrifice these lambs. The blood would drain. Some of it they caught in the basin. They take the hyssop and they dip the hyssop into the blood. And what would they do with it? Put it on the doorpost and on the lentil, right? The doorpost and the lentil. Now, unlike this lentil, it would extend out of beyond there a little further. Isn't that interesting? So the lamb is sacrificed right here in the gutter. And then they would place the blood upon the doorposts and the lentils on each side. Sacrifice between what? Wow, isn't that amazing? Hmm. And when did that occur? The 14th day of the Jewish month of Nizan. And how many days journey would they go? Three. How many days journey would they go? Three. And then what would happen after three days? God would show his deliverance on his people. That on the 17th day of Nizan, what took place? The Red Sea parted. The ark rested. The Red Sea parted. All symbol, type, sign of which the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reality. A new opportunity, a new world for Noah and his family. Moses and the children of Israel now going from slavery in Egypt is might as well reckon them dead. Right? As slaves in Egypt, you're going to die in that bondage? And now they cross the Red Sea on dry land on the 17th day of Nizan, and they are resurrected from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? Noah and his family resurrected to a new life after the death of a previous world. The children of Israel resurrected after they're dying as slaves in Egypt. And you and I, listen to me now, if you're truly a believer, you have experienced a spiritual resurrection in your life. Old things have, and behold, all things have become. Absolutely. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. See, I was way ahead of myself before, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, you know, this, I feel so inadequate in sharing on days like today. It's such an important day. It's such a monumental day, and I... And, Lord, forgive me, I know mere men. And the best of men are men at best. That's all we are. But what I'm trying to express to you, what is in my heart, I guess Franklin Graham's giving a message today at 12 o'clock, resurrection for the, for, for the United States and for the people of Ukraine. But he shared previously this week, he said, uh, unfortunately, the majority of Christianity, the majority of Christians in the world only give God lip service. That's exactly what he said. The majority of Christianity simply give God lip service. And the only person that you are deceiving is yourself. Only deceiving yourself. Listen to me, beloved. The, the evidence that you are born again, resurrected from being spiritually dead is you're living a new life. You're living in a newness of the power of the resurrected Christ. Do you understand? That's the evidence. That's the assurance. Jesus himself said in chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, beginning in verse 23, he would have great crowds gather together. And, and as soon as there was always a great crowd, you know what Jesus did? And you can find this in every, every single gospel. Whenever there was a great crowd to gather together, and what did Jesus do? <laughs> he, he, he taught on the cost of discipleship, didn't he? He did. And that's what he's doing here. Why is he doing that? Be because he doesn't want any actors or actresses among his children because they would deceive them. 
because they would be hurt, you see. It's important that we allow the Word of God to do what the Word of God can only do. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts, and it divides asunder. And what does it cut? What does it divide? Between that which is spiritual and that which is fleshly. That which is heavenly, that which, which is earthly or hellish. And it's supposed to do that. A proper teaching of the Word of God always will divide. Paul said divisions must come, beloved. Why must they come? To show those who are approved. That's what the Bible teaches us. So any good pastor, when he teaches the scripture, should always comfort the afflicted. Those who recognize we're simply mere men and all we can offer God is our sinfulness and our wretchedness in exchange he gives us the, life, the beauty of his life. But we afflict the comfortable and the proud. That's what the word of God should do. If you think you have something to offer God, you're sadly mistaken. God didn't simply hit the lottery the day he got you. No, 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 no. This is something. You know. So Jesus teaches on the cross of discipleship in verse 23 of chapter 9. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's living the resurrected life because you, you, you first became a participant in the fellowship of his suffering. That's what Paul said. I only purpose to know two things, the fellowship of the suffering of Christ in my self-denial and the power of his resurrection in living a completely new life. Hmm? For take up your cross daily and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, will save it. How did he win? By losing. By losing. How do we win? By losing the same way he lost his life on our behalf and we lose our life for him. For whatever advantage is to a man that if he gains a whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost. He might be able to buy Twitter, but you know. <laughs> for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man will be ashamed when he comes into his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angel. More succinctly, Jesus gave us an example in verse 57 of chapter 9. Again, on this cost of discipleship, come follow me, Jesus said. Following Jesus is following the example he gave us. Not living for the pleasures of this life, but living for the glory of the Father. And then we, in turn, live for the glory of the Son. Verse 57. Now it happened as he journeyed on the road that someone, just the someone, said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Listen with your eyes. This is what he claimed. What did Franklin say? A lot of people give God, I will follow wherever you go, Lord. Remember Israel when they got, were given the law by Moses? All that the Lord said we will do. How did it work out for him? Hmm. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, he is leading his disciples on to Jerusalem. He's already informed them what's going to happen in Jerusalem. They didn't understand it fully. But the son of man would suffer many things, be mocked, and then crucified. But he would raise on the third day. So he's on his way to his death. And he told this young man, okay, fine. Come follow me. And you'll have to give up everything that you hold dear in this life. You'll have to give up those pleasures, those expectations, those dreams, those ones that you have in exchange for what I have for you. If I had the opportunity to speak to my, my brothers and sisters in Ukraine this morning, I'd tell them, can Jesus trust you with the suffering he's privileged you to have? Isn't that a strange way of looking at things? And, but that's what I would ask them. Jesus wants to know, can he trust you with the suffering that he allows to come into your life for your perfection, for your maturity, and for his glory? Or will you cut and run? Will you say, if that's love, I don't want anything to do with it? Will you, like this young man, just walk away? You mean I have to give up everything? Now, he may not want everything from you, but he wants to know that in your heart, you will give up everything 
for him because in him you gain everything. By losing, you win. Right? A second man came to him. And then another said, follow. And then he said to another, just as he said to all of the other disciples, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first. Those are the operative words here in these next two gentlemen. What's the word? Me. First. Me. First. Who does he worship? Me, myself, and I. Right? Isn't that interesting? Look what he said. Let, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Is his father dead? And Jesus doesn't want him to bury his father? No, of course not. Why? Why, was it, why is his father not dead? The Jews had to bury the dead within how long? 24 hours. If his father had died, he would already be in the process of arranging his father's burial. The service for his father. What was he really saying? Wait till my father dies and I can collect my... Some, some people can't wait for a relative to die, can they? You know? They're already counting what they're going to get before they die. Look at how... Look at how and what a sad, sad commentary instead of affairs it is when the church, when people within the church, siblings, brothers and sisters, family, argue over stuff. We'd never experienced it, have you? Ever? <laughs> of course you have. Yeah, anybody who dies with any substantial wealth, then there's a team of lawyers that get involved. Rather than pastors and grief counselors, lawyers. Let me first bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the necros bury their own necros, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. What's he saying there? Let the dead bury the dead. You know what the word dead is? Necros, you know what it means? Corpse. As far as Jesus was concerned, those who were not born spiritually, resurrected spiritually, were dead already. They were corpse. They're dead while they yet live. First Timothy, chapter 5, verse 6, he states, she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Speaking of a widow who is in want, a widow who's Pursuing pleasure rather than the Lord. Dead while she yet lives. James puts it another way in James 2.26. For as the body without the spirit is necros, dead, a corpse. So faith without works or obedience is dead. James would say, you say you have works, I say I have faith. Excuse me, you say you have faith, I, I say I have works. Show me your faith, I'll show you my works. You see, when God saves you, when you're resurrected spiritually, you can't help but produce good works. You really start to love your wife, don't you, Nathan? Not loving yourself and loving what she can do for you, but you love her for what you can do for her now. How's it working out, okay? Good, good, good. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell to those who are at my house. What was he saying? Wait till there's a better, a more opportune time. And oh, by the way, let me, let me just go back and uh, enjoy my family. And, and, and I'll, I'll say it later. I'll say it later. I'll get to it. No. No, there's never a better time to start serving the Lord than when? No, no, no. no. And Jesus said to him, no one, having put their hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Remember who? I'm sorry, some of you said it. Remember who? Lot's wife. That's what we learned last week. Jesus indicating, remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife when she started to run out of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, started to run out of that old life when God wanted to bring her into a resurrected life? She looked back, thinking there was something there to offer her, and there was nothing at all, nothing. Colossians chapter 2, turn with me there. What are we talking about? Listen to me, the main point of this morning's message is are you living the resurrected life? 
We presented a historical argument for the resurrection. Paul presented the, the uh, logical argument for the resurrection. He presented a, a theological argument for the resurrection. And, and now we're talking about an experiential argument for the resurrection, not the experiential argument that Paul argued, but I'm telling you that we have an experiential argument or apologetic that we can bring to the world on the resurrection of Jesus Christ by living a resurrected life, Amen. which few ever do. I just 30 years I've been pre 30 years 42 years I've been a Christian it brings me to nauseam the number of people that just give my Jesus lip service the number of people where, where I listen with my ears but when I really listen with my eyes I see something totally different I see someone completely disengaged from living an obedient life to Jesus Christ it is obedience to Christ and all that he's commanded us that produces to the world the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ has risen from the dead in my life 42 years ago and I'm still giving evidence of it and it's not by my power but it's by his power. Do you understand? That's the joy of being a Christian. We go from that, 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 that death in the ark and then into a new life, a new opportunity, just as Noah and his family. We go from being slaves in bondage to sin, to breaking forth into the promised land, into the new abundant life that Christ has to offer us, godliness with contentment. Great gain. Great gain. Living that resurrected power. And that's precisely what Jesus has for every one of his children who truly believe. Not here, here. And if that's not you, admit it. Stop deceiving yourself and live for Christ, which is great gain, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain. What did I say? Colossians 2, verse 11. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> in him you were also crucified, cruci <laughs> circumcised, excuse me. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What circumcision are we talking about? Romans tells us it's a circumcision of the heart and of the spirit. The covenant of circumcision was given to the people of Israel to, to, to show that they belong to God. Not the cutting away the foreskin of the flesh, but the, but the cutting away of the sinfulness of the heart and the renewing of the spirit, having a resurrected spirit now, which was previously dead to Christ, dead to God. We're buried with him in baptism in which you also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead, necros, dead, your corpse and your trespasses and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive, resurrected together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Have you been resurrected? I have experienced the fellowship of his suffering. There's so many things he asked me to give up, to allow to die in my life for him. And in my willingness to do that, take up your cross daily, come follow me, he gives you the power to live that resurrected life. The power to love in a very supernatural way. The power to forgive. The power to patiently endure. The power to fulfill all of the one another commands that are given in the Bible that I see very rarely. Or marriage wouldn't be at the epidemic state. Divorce wouldn't be at the ep epidemic state that it is in the church today. Marriage is a sacred, sacred, sacred institution that God has established in God's law. Whom he raised from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. How, how, do, you, how do you live? And, and I, I tell my wife this all the time. You know, my, she just, she's always so critical of herself. 
And I tell her, honey, you got to live in the freedom of his forgiveness. I know in my heart I'm forgiven of everything I've ever done. Everything I will do and everything I will ever do. I'm, I'm forgiven. But I'm, I'm with all my heart surrendering and yielding my life to him so that he could live his life through me. Living the Christian life is not you living to some legalistic code. That's pharisaical. That's trying to live to the law, you're dead. You, you can live to sin, you're dead. You live to the law, you're dead. You've got to live to Christ and you come alive through the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's a hard issue. It's a relationship, you see. And you he made alive with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. You were a necros, spiritually dead, a corpse. Now he has resurrected you, and he has made you alive in Christ. Romans chapter 6. Paul understood this better than anyone. It comes out so clearly in his epistles. Paul's treatise on the grace of God. He has to spend the first seven chapters getting you what? Lost. He, has to, he spends the first seven, seven chapters getting you lost. If you're a religionist, you're lost. If you're a heathen, you're lost. It doesn't matter. You can be steeped in sin and just say, let any, everything go. You're, you're still damned. Or you can be living to some religious code that you think you're winning approval before God. You're damned. Either way. But then that glorious eighth chapter speaks about living life in the power of the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, in the newness of life, in the resurrected life that only Christ could give. That's what his resurrection celebration today means to you and I. It's a gift right now where we will live in the resurrection today. Today. What is six? Chapter 6 of Romans, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He must have been real. He must have had a, a foresight of the contemporary church, huh? You think? He saw way out into the future. Hey, do you know that the church in 2022 believes you can have a lost life and a saved soul? Do you know that that's what the majority of the church believes today? That you can presume upon the grace of God? You can continue in sin so that grace may abound? And what does Paul say to that? Perish the thought. God forbid. No! <laughs> no, you can't live in sin and believe you still have the grace of God. No! All right, so I'm a little frustrated. But isn't it a shame what the church has become? Isn't it a shame what, what they claim to be the Lord's house, the Lord in the house? As a Chinese house church leader said, it's amazing what the church in the West has been able to do without the Holy Spirit. Isn't it true? Or am I a liar? No, 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 certainly not. Perish the thought. God forbid. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? You, listen, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, the power of the resurrection, you can't. What happens when you go and try to enjoy the pleasures of sin once again? You don't. You're absolutely miserable, aren't you? Good for nothing. Before, when you were in sin and you were that heathen, I mean, you, you enjoyed it. You were a pig in the pig pen, right? But you're not a pig anymore. What are you now? <laughs> you're a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when the lamb ends up in the slop with the pigs? <laughs> you can't. Before you... Oh. <laughs> now listen to me. If you can continue in sin and still enjoy it, and there's no conviction, you are not saved. And I make no apology for that. That's the truth. If you can continue living a life of sin, habitual sin... And there's no conviction. You're not saved. You don't have the power of the resurrection. You better come to the cross. And you better do it fast because he's coming. He doesn't want you there. Neither do I. There's enough lamb for everyone. For everyone. 
Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the resurrection. That's what he's talking about. The newness of life is walking in the power of the resurrection, living a resurrected life. I was dead spiritually, and now I am alive spiritually. We will experience, those who are true believers, two resurrections. You'll experience the resurrection of the spirit, and you'll experience one day the resurrection of your flesh. Wow, won't that be something? Hmm? For if we believe, excuse me, verse 5, for if we have been united together with the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his Paul says it plainly. What are you going to experience? No, come on. If you really have died with Christ, died yourself, took up your cross daily, followed him, what are you experiencing? The resurrected life. Beautiful, beautiful. You know the song? Jesus is beautiful. And Jesus, you don't know the song. <laughs> makes beautiful things of my life. The Jesus movement. When I first got saved, I sung, sung that constantly. Because that's what he was doing. I was being renewed. The dead old man that I was was now alive in Christ. My spirit was alive. And he was making everything beautiful. Everything he touches becomes beautiful. Your relationship with him. Your marriage. Your relationship with your children. Your extended family. Your relationship with your neighbor. Everything becomes beautiful. Why? You're living a resurrected life. You're living a resurrected life. In the power of the resurrection through the person of the Holy Spirit. And if, I'm, if what I'm sharing with you this morning is convicting you, then when you go home, you get on your knees and you pray for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to enter into your life right now. The floods came, and they banged on the door, and it was too late. Who closed the door? God. God. I hear the door shutting now. We're in the 11th hour, and the door is shutting. And soon it will be closed. Today, today, if you will hear his voice, today, if you will hearken, you today is what? The day of salvation. And you, and you may be so dead spiritually that you're numb to everything I'm saying right now. You're going to go out of here and there won't be any difference whatsoever in your life. You go home and have your Easter ham. <laughs> For if we've been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been set free from sin. Is that true? Yeah. If you really understand what today represents, not just a new beginning for Noah and his family, not just a new beginning for Israel as they cross the Red Sea, a new beginning for everyone who would believe. And we're going to go from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2. There. I would be doing the privilege of ministry that God has given me a tremendous disservice if I did not warn people today if I did not warn them of the judgment to come. A minister could never do any more than what the Holy Spirit can do, can they? But at least, at least we should do what the Holy Spirit has called us to do, what the Holy Spirit has come to do. For the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus said, to convict of sin, sin righteousness. righteousness, and the judgment to come. Of sin. Because they truly didn't believe in their heart. There are many who will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And he'll say, depart from me, I never 
had the communion with you, had this relationship with you, had this intimacy with you. I Listen to me. The, the word there in, in the Hebrew is yada. In the New Testament, it speaks of the same thing. It speaks of a communion and a union that a man has with a woman he loves. Right? Well, if you love her, smile. There you go, there you go. <laughs> We are betrothed to one, right? And just, listen, just as in the marriage relationship, okay, there is this oneness that occurs, and the oneness, the, the most primitive or basic oneness of the marriage relationship is the physical union. And that physical union is just the first rung on the ladder that you climb to oneness because you come, become one in every way. But we, we call that intercourse. Now the highest essence or the quintessence of the word and the meaning of the word is when the Holy Spirit presses life into mine. How can this be? I have never known a man. Who said that? Mary. And what happened? The Holy Spirit pressed his life into hers. And she lived in the resurrection power of Christ. Right? Now listen to me. Listen to me. Just as the Holy Spirit came upon Mary for the glory of God. The Holy Spirit today, because of the resurrection of Christ, her son, wants to come into your life so that you can live for the glory of God. Do you understand that? Do you? Have you experienced it? That's what's most important. And you, you, he made alive, resurrected, who were dead spiritually in trespasses and sins. In, this is chapter 2, verse 1. Did I say that? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Don't you understand? He, who, as she, anybody who lives in pleasure is dead while they yet live. That's exactly what he's saying. That's who we were. Do you remember those days? It grieves me. It grieves me to think back to those days. I pray, that every, I pray every single one of those little sweethearts up here this morning will never, ever know a day they haven't walked with him. They'll never know the rebellion that I walked in, that some of you walked in. It's not necessary, you know. Right, Lena? We can live an obedient life to Jesus now, right? Yeah, especially in our youth, right? Anna? Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he has resurrected us together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Do you see it? Made alive, resurrected. You were dead spiritually, and now in Christ you're alive spiritually. That's what happened when Adam forfeited all the promises that God had made to him when he gave up this world and the promises therein and he forfeited all to Satan. That day, every human being was destined to spiritual death. They were born sinners, spiritually dead. But now in Christ, as in Adam all, but in Christ all are resurrected, made alive. Resurrected. To understand Resurrection is not a concept for you to intellectually grasp. No, it's got to go, you got to go way beyond that. It's a life that you're called to experience. And it can't really be explained. But boy, you know when you experience it, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that forever, for the ages to come, that forever he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus that you will, throughout all eternity, you will experiencing and understanding God's great love for you. So great is his love. We can't understand. Can we? It, it's a love that Paul says is inexpressible. You can't express it. You, you, can't, you can't explain it, but you sure can experience it. Can't. You know when the love of God has touched your life, don't you? Yeah. This time of year, there's so many wonderful uh, 
depictions of the life of Christ and, and, and the incarnation, and the, the life of Christ, the resurrection that I love to... And, and I cry over them every year. Now, those movies aren't that good. That's not why I'm crying. I'm crying because he touched me. One of my favorite scenes in the movie Jesus of Nazareth, you know, it's a six-hour film. It takes Gail and I 12 days to watch it. <laughs> you know, no, she's good for 30 minutes, and then she's gone. <laughs> you know. Mary Magdalene. What was Mary's old life characterized as? No. <laughs> no, she wasn't a prostitute. You know, that's what everybody says. There's not, there's not a single verse in the scriptures that would indicate she was a prostitute. She's going to deal with a lot of people when they get to heaven <laughs> for slandering her. She was a woman who was possessed by seven demons. We know that. We don't know that she was a prostitute. But we do know she was demonically controlled like much of the world. <clears throat> but Jesus set her free. Oh, what a difference it made, right? Mary, Mary, what's happened to you? One day I was this way and then I met him. And now I'm this way. Everything changes, right? And so there's that scene where he's going to feed the 5,000 men plus women and children. God knows how many. And, and, and she's sitting there and she sees what is happening miraculously. And he's already touched her life. She's already been changed. And as they're distributing the fish and the, and the loaves, she takes the bread. She's breaking the bread and she's breaking the bread. She's crying. <laughs> I cry every time I think about what he's done for me. I cry every time I think about how I'm living in his power now. Not that filthy, disgusting, dead life that I was living, but now a beautiful, resurrected, sacrificial life for him. That's what he's called us to, beloved. I can't make it any plainer. If you're part of the me first crowd, get out of here. Because you're going to contaminate these who are here. If that's where you are, please. If you're not going to come to Christ, you're not going to surrender, you're not going to fall on your knees, then go. Because you're going to hurt somebody. The me first crowd. But if it's Jesus first, if it's Jesus only. Hmm. Can I have a couple of minutes? Or you need to run? Mark's gospel on the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Remember? The inner circle. Who were the inner circle? Peter, James, and John. Right? There was the 70. There were the multitudes, right? Then he reduced it down to the 70. Then they went out in 35 evangelistic teams. Then he reduced the 70 down to the 12. He reduced the 12 down to the 3. He reduced the 3 down to the 1, the beloved, John. I'm living for you, you Jesus, and you only. But there, Jesus was transfigured before them. Peter said, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles. And then they heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then it was Jesus only. And then they asked the question, what does this mean, the power of the resurrection? It's really good for us to commune with the Lord today. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, even the more so as you see the day approaching. A lot of people sitting home in their pajamas with their coffee, you're not experiencing the power of the resurrection as we fellowship in communion. You understand that? There's a huge difference between watching a message online and being among God's people. There's a spiritual dynamic that takes place as we collectively bring in the Christ with us, Right? It's good for us to be here. It's good for us to see Jesus only in our lives. Not me first, Jesus only. And then, then you will experience what is meant by this resurrection from the dead. Mm. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That on yourselves that a gift of God, not of works, this any man should boast. Now most want to stop right there. Right? Why? Because what does the next verse tell us? 
for we are his workmanship, poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him that we should live in them. Where are you living? You're living in the resurrection power of Christ? Are you living the resurrected life that Christ offers you? Or is it just in your head? You just show up on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. Or maybe you're even a Saturday morning guy. That doesn't win you any favor with God, does it? No, not if it's not motivated by your heart's desire to know him more, to experience him more. I purpose to know only him, Jesus only, and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection today. Today, if you will hear, listen to me. What this day represents, the 17th day of Nazan, a new opportunity for Noah and his family, a new opportunity for the children of Israel, a new opportunity for the world to go from death to life. You, you can be an apologetic to your neighbors, to your family, to your friends, wherever you're going this afternoon to uh, enjoy a little food. You can be that argument for the realization, the evidence, the validation, the affirmation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not 2,000 years ago. Right now, 2022 in your life. Live the resurrected life. For in Adam, all died. But in Christ, listen to me, in Christ, all who are obedient, if you believe you're obedient, all who are obedient, live. Amen? Pastor David, you got a closing song? Shall we stand?